I have to go now to London, and uh, so we said goodbye, and I thought nothing more about it. I'd like to ask you, in your article, you describe Pabst in relation to Pandora's box, where you, in the sense that Pabst, you felt, was also acting the role of Dr. Sean in relation to you. And I think you say he was not aroused by sexual love, which he dismissed as an enervating myth. It was sexual, sexual love. It was sexual hate, which yes. engrossed his whole being in yes. its flaming reality. Yes. Um, that, that was, it, it, he didn't believe in any time. He was not a sentimental man. It was the one thing that made him great, because uh, that didn't bother him. But I want to tell you about a uh, diary. And the phone rang one morning and said, Luis. Mr. Pops, I said, yes, he said, I'm going to make a picture with you in it, he said, uh, and you're to come to Berlin, I said, all right, he said, now, of course, it's my company, and I can't pay you a thousand a week, I'll give you 500, and you get on the train and come, so I got on the train, and I went, and that's how we came to make diary, but then again, this time, I had in tow, the Eskimo, but they called him the Eskimo, because his hair was perfectly blonde, so they looked like uh, a white fur cat. He was living on a small allowance when I met him at a party. And he came to live with me. And he said, and who is this? I, I said, the Eskimo. I, the Baron Beak, I said. He was family. He was really a Baron, but that didn't impress Pabst. So all the time we made a diary, I had uh, Esky in tow. Fritz Rasp, as you know, plays the uh, mm -hmm. chemi uh, chemist assistant who seduces me first. And came the time when we were to do the scene where he has made me promise that I will get out of bed at 11 at night and come down and meet him in the uh, pharmacy. So he perhaps went through a lot of nightgowns and he'd feel them and finally he picked out a nightgown. And now he said, you've got a lot of Japanese robes at home, silk or short ones like this, but soft. Ja now he said, let's go and look in your trunk. So we went and we looked through my trunk and he picked out a soft blue and white and he said, that's it. So I wake up in bed, and I get up, and I come down. where we talk, and then Rasp holds me, and then we turn, and he's a very big man, which helped. And I liked him very much, of course. That's all, really. Sex is so different now, isn't it? But you got more sex out of that scene, just the way he picked me up 
and moved right out through the curtains. So this was all a scene of touch, almost no words. Just, it was really a, a ballet. Did he, during the making of the film, did you see the rushes? One day he said, you did that scene very well. He said, come on in the, the uh, uh, well, whenever you ran the rushes, come into the studio. And I went in and I was just horrified. And I heard him say uh, to, to Falk and Beckett that great mistake, great mistake, never do that again, never. And that was, he never did it again. And so I never knew at all and, and never what, paid the slightest attention. What horrified you about it? About it? I mean, because you looked gorgeous. Well, you don't, don't you see, unless, that's why I was never an actress. I never was in love with myself. I would go to a party and I'd see Dolores Del Rio and Constance Talmadge and, and Constance Bennett, all these beautiful women, and I'd say, you're the ugliest one here. You're black and furry, you've got freckles, your dress is not as attractive. And in the end, so it, unless you can't be a great actress, unless you think you're beautiful, and you, uh, it's of the essence. And... Uh, I yeah, I'm wondering what sense you mean a great actress, because I mean sense, a great I mean, you're, but you're a contradiction of this. No, I'm not. To be a great actress, you must know what you're doing. When I write my little piece, I know exactly what I'm doing. Yeah. When I acted, I hadn't the slightest idea of what I was doing. I was simply playing myself, which is the hardest thing in the world to do. Mm -hmm. you, you can give most actors any part in the world and they can play it, but they say, be yourself. They get terribly self-conscious. But since I never learned to act, I never had any trouble playing myself. I was fascinated with Pabst and his women and how he felt about them. Garbo, when I met him at 28, he said, you've met Garbo. I said, yes. Would you know her very well? I, I said, pretty well. One's always very careful. Oh, and he raved about her. And one day we had tea in his apartment, Heinrich Mann and uh, other people. Very intellectual tea, and very boring. But he took me to a big cupboard he had, and he had just hundreds of sills of garble. Oh, he thought she was so marvelous. And he showed me all these stills and talked about her, talked about her, and talked about her. Oh, and I know there's something I'd like to know about. I must have been 15. Someone in London took me to a dance recital and I'd never been to a dance recital, I'd been to the ballet and all that, but this was modern dance and the name stuck indelibly in my head. I don't know a blessed thing about dance, but it was Valeska Gert. And I remember it vividly because she had a very loose costume on and her She was a Mary Bagman. Her breasts kept flapping out and I was terribly impressed. You must have I mean you knew her, you worked with her. He adored Velasco, good. And he used her in, in, in three, uh, he used her in, uh, he used her in Diary, mm -hmm. Joyless Street, she played the marvelous scene with the butcher. Oh, it's wonderful. It's all set up. The madam set it up for the big fat butcher to have an affair with Garbo. In fact, she was the madam. And he's sitting here with his pale, languid, and suddenly over the screen, you know the French screen? Through the screen, he sees this leering face with a slight black mustache. to hell with this milkless, bloodless thing around here, and so he goes to bed with care.